So today I want to talk about one of my favorite security controls. I've mentioned it lots in my articles and other YouTube videos. It's one that I think is massively powerful and can be hugely impactful in stopping attackers. And that is Endpoint Detection and Response, commonly known as EDR. In this video, I'm going to talk about the history of EDR, how it works today and how it's set up and the different components, some of the benefits of using EDR, equally some of the challenges and considerations, some real world examples, and then I'll talk about the future as well. So let's start off with a little bit of history of endpoint detection. So not that long ago, attackers were using the same tools again and again and we could use signature hashes to detect those. So something like an MD5 or a SHA hash of a file, that's all we needed as defenders to detect and then block that activity on our endpoints. And that's commonly known as antivirus. And that was effective for a while, but it wasn't long until attackers started changing their hashes every time they ran code, or they were using legitimate binaries on machines, so really difficult for AV to detect. The iteration of antivirus was EDR, so looking more at telemetry, looking for signatures of activity, and then detecting based on those. And I've talked before about David Bianco's Pyramid of Pain. It's a really good diagram that explains different types of detection options. At the bottom, there's signatures, IPs, hashes, really easy for us as defenders to detect, really easy as well for the attackers to change. EDR still does all that good stuff, but it's higher in the pyramid where EDR really starts kicking in. When we start talking about tools and TTPs, that's tactics, techniques, and procedures, EDR is massively more effective than traditional antivirus in countering those. So EDR goes beyond those traditional signatures. It's looking for these patterns of activity, really common attacker TTPs, and sometimes really rare ones as well, using things like machine learning and AI. It can identify anomalies and either block processes, quarantine files, or take other response actions, all in the background, all automatically in a lot of cases as well. But where it can't take action, maybe if it's not got the, the confidence that an alert is a true positive, EDR, and specifically the R, the response part of EDR, provides us as defenders with some brilliant options to actually go and deal with what's going on on a box. So for example, we can quarantine machines, remove files, fetch files, push scripts, do a bunch of smart stuff. And indeed, if you speak to a lot of instant response consultants, the, the folks that go in after a big data breach or a ransomware attack, often the first thing they'll do, if it's not already been done, is deploy EDR across an estate because it gives them such fantastic visibility and those response options as well. So EDR is made up of three components, an agent, a management console, and then a threat feed. The agent is what we deploy onto servers and workstations. It's a little bit of software. It hoovers up telemetry. It's the one that does the response actions. It's looking for that suspicious activity that it can go and block or quarantine. The management console is where policies are configured. And as users and admins, we can go in there and create response actions and view incidents. Then the threat feed is what gets created by the vendor. And generally that's signatures of suspicious activity. So different process trees may be that it thinks is suspicious. Different activities into quite a lot of detail that attackers are using that EDR will then go and detect or it will go and block. And one of the main reasons I really find EDR a powerful tool is because hackers have shown again and again that they are super interested in workstations, specifically where users are hanging out. If you've got users on a machine, you've got things like credentials, so that could be passwords, um, access tokens, API keys, SSH keys. You've got inboxes, so you've got a vast trove of potentially sensitive information. You've got file shares, you've got hard drives full of information. There's so much that you can pull from an endpoint. And that's why attackers again and again, and we keep seeing this, they target them. The M-Trends report from Mandiant this year, they talk about the average dwell time of a cyber attack being up to 10 days. So that's 10 days that an attacker may be operating in an environment. All that time they can observe users, they can steal documentation, they can learn about the environment. That's a really scary prospect. And I think EDR is a really key tool in making it a hostile environment for attackers, making that dwell time much, much shorter, making it a difficult space to operate in. Generally as well, EDR can give you a lot more configurability in your environment. So for example, you can use it to block what may only be suspicious activity 
something that may not be malicious, but if you're confident it should never happen in your environment, but you know attackers are using it elsewhere, you can leverage EDR and custom rules to go create something that means it can't happen in your environment. So you know if you hear it happening elsewhere, it can't happen to you. So for example, although EDR isn't an application control tool, I've used it in previous roles for blocking specific applications that I know attackers always use, but in our environment we would never need. So for instance, MSHTA is a really good example. It's used to run HTA files. It's a lol bin, if you're familiar with those, that's living off the land binaries. And you can use EDR just to kill it outright. So if an attacker gets into your environment and they try and leverage MSHTA, they won't be able to. So it's worth considering the costs and the challenges. So EDR generally isn't cheap. I think there's some more affordable options on the market, but for a good EDR, you've got to spend some money. In addition, EDR generally will need some tuning. So if you think it's looking for suspicious or what it thinks is suspicious or malicious activity, and it may be either alerting you on that or blocking activity. So generally when you deploy it to an environment, you go for a period of tuning where you look for false positives and they will occur and you create exclusions for those in EDR. So it doesn't block those and doesn't disrupt users. So something I just touched on is alerting. So EDR, generally speaking, is gonna block or quarantine or contain what it is, has high confidence is malicious activity. Now, if it's not sure, it's gonna surface that to an analyst in something like an alert or an incident. It won't take any action and it's relying on us as administrators or security professionals to be able to investigate that. So it's just a factor. If you're thinking of deploying a tool like EDR, just be aware that it's not a zero touch, you leave it and it does its thing. There will be alerts that need a little bit of investigating, also true positives and false positives that you need to dig into to understand how they got there and why they alerted. In terms of real world use cases, there's three I've written about previously, which are just dying for EDR that had EDR in their environments. And one specifically, they talk about in a report that EDR would have made a massive difference. It could have prevented breaches. So the three are the ransomware against the Irish Health Service, the ransomware against the British Library, and then lastly, the Chinese state intrusion into the US Office of Personnel Management. The first two are very common ransomware attacks. I've written about them previously, and if you read through, you hear that there was so much endpoint activity from those attackers. Had they had EDR, the likelihood is they would have been prevented and stopped. The final one, the Office of Personnel Management, is a really interesting breach. I've written about it. I've made a YouTube video about it. But in a inquiry into it, they actually call out that literally towards right towards the end of the incident, they finally deployed EDR. They hadn't previously, and they finally deployed it and it just lit up like a Christmas tree and detected loads of attacker activity in their environment. Had they had that to begin with, maybe the breach would never have occurred. So thinking about the future then, I think one of the kind of exciting things about our industry is that we've got these sophisticated adversaries that are always improving and finding new ways around our defenses. And then in parallel, an industry that's developing new tools and technologies to counter those. One of the ones that's caught my eye recently is XDR. So extended detection and response or what some other vendors are calling next gen SIEM. And this is a way to bring together lots of different data sources from your security tooling, create alerts using all of that data, but also response actions. So for example, or being able to have, say, EDR detect a critical alert on a host, being able to pull all the logged in users for that host and then go lock all their accounts in your identity tooling, all in near real time. That's a really exciting proposition, something traditionally would be done manually by an analyst. If you're in a small shop, you may not even have that ability. So a really exciting area. I think another exciting angle is EDR for the cloud. We have so many companies now having definitely a cloud presence, lots being cloud native the ability to detect and respond in that space. It's relatively new. There's only a few tools out there that I've seen that do it really well. And I think being able to have one tool that can both do your endpoint estate and your cloud would be hugely powerful. And I think with that, in addition, because we have seen intrusions that either start in the cloud and then move on-prem or start on-prem and then move to the cloud and having something that can detect and respond across both of those on one intrusion would be really beneficial. So that's all I've got time for today. I hope you found this interesting. I can't underscore enough how much I value EDR as a security control. I think the vast majority of companies and organizations would benefit from it. I know it's not the cheapest tool out there, but I think whilst we've still got attackers who love targeting workstations and endpoints, it really is super valuable. Anyway, I hope you found this useful and I'll see you again soon.